the competency to proceed. Um, the, as we all are aware at this point, Mr. Clay had had some difficulties last night and early this morning. Um, he was in a fight with another inmate at the beginning around 4 24 in the morning, and deputies who responded to that afraid ended up getting into a Mr. Whitehead as well. We don't know whether or not more criminal charges are forthcoming. All right, hang on, hang on. I need to make the record clear about something else, too. You casually mentioned at the bench earlier about um, the possibility of a gag order as it relates to these proceedings. I'm going to treat that as an oral motion. Um, I'm going to deny that request at this time based on the fact that the jury has been impaneled, has been instructed several times not to watch the media accounts. I um, am required by law to set a hearing with notice to the media if I intend to uh, hold a hearing. I don't find that at this stage in the proceedings, based on the fact that the jury's admonishments and my intent to constantly ask them if they've heard any news reports, but I don't think the defense has made a showing of the appropriateness of a gag order as it relates to the proceedings in this case. So that request is denied, however informally it was made. Um, the defendant is set up, though, via video and audio camera with connection to the holding cell. Is that correct, Deputy Edwards? Yes, and the deputy in the cell can hear what's going on right now. See and hear what's going on. And the, he's responded to you via radio that he can, he, meaning the deputy and Mr. Whitehead then, who he's with, can see and hear the proceedings? Yes, he takes them. Thank you. All right. So, uh, indeed, Mr. Whitehead is not present in court. Um, arrangements have been made for uh, his indirect participation by way of the video feed to the cell. Uh, putting on the record some of the facts that have given rise to the defense's claim of incompetency or the request that be evaluated uh, involve allegations of violence between Mr. Whitehead and another inmate, as well as Mr. Whitehead and jail deputies. We proceeded to select a jury and a panel jury yesterday. The jury was sworn. Uh, Mr. Whitehead was present in court, and during those proceedings, he participated actively and cogently and communicated well with uh, the defense team in regards to an appropriate panel. Uh, leading up to yesterday's jury selection, Mr. Whitehead had uh, resisted changing out from jail clothes to a proper, to appropriate courtroom attire and had to be persuaded uh, by uh, public defender investigator George McNamara. Uh, after Mr. Whitehead dressed out, he was refusing and reluctant to come out into the courtroom. And I could visually see a couple of times uh, as Mr. Whitehead approached the courtroom, he would get to the doorway and actually peek out and then step back. He did not want to come out into the courtroom. It was only after Mr. McNamara again spoke to Mr. Whitehead and asked him to do that, to come out into the courtroom and participate, that Mr. Whitehead was willing to do so. In the course of jury selection, Mr. Whitehead would come in and out of, of responsiveness, various levels of response. Uh, he often had to be encouraged. It's going to be okay. Uh, you're doing okay. You're doing all right. This is part of the process. This is necessary. And we would encourage him in more like we would encourage a child. And so today, uh, after the early morning developments at the jail, um, Mr. McNamara and I spoke to Mr. Whitehead, and the only thing he would say to either one of us was, I want to lay down. We noted that he had injuries to his head. He had a scratch or abrasions to the right side of his head. Mr. McNamara noted additional injuries to the side of his head. Um, according to the police report, the fight that he had with the other inmate only resulted in an injury to Mr. Whitehead's lip. Uh, no other injuries were noted, which means that the head injuries, the other head injuries um, were obviously sustained as a result of Mr. Whitehead's um, interaction with the jail deputies, which indicate that Mr. Whitehead had spit on one of the deputies, which led to his having to be further restrained. Um, Mr. Whitehead is clearly 
having difficulties adapting to the courtroom environment where he is knowingly, understandably facing life in prison. He has, in our observation as a defense team, grown increasingly unable to adapt to the approaching trial date. Sometimes he would refuse to come down and speak to us altogether. But when we did speak to him, and he was capable of proceeding and interacting with us on an intelligent level regarding his case, he was very helpful. Up to this point, we had not seen any indications that he was incompetent because when he was able to engage with us, he was able to engage and he did. But the trial is another matter. For whatever reason, there is something obstructing Mr. Whitehead's ability to proceed or process the reality of this procedure, this legal procedure. And we don't know what it is. We, obviously, he does have injuries to his head. He has not been examined when it comes to whatever may have taken place between him and the jail deputies. The, 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 the charging document is very vague about how they responded other than to grab Mr. Whitehead around the waist and take him to the ground and eventually get him in a position where they could put handcuffs on him. So we don't know exactly what led to those head injuries. We do know that, that Mr. Whitehead, the only thing coming out of his mouth right now is, I want to lay down. Um, according to Holmes v. State, 494, 7 2nd, 230, it's a third DCA case from 1986. And applying the Dusky Standard, Dusky v. United States, 362 U.S. 402. Due process requires the defendant not be made to stand trial unless he has a sufficient present ability to consult with his attorney with a reasonable degree of rational understanding and a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against him. Now, whether or not Mr. Whitehead had an ability to do that yesterday, according to the Dusky Standard, makes little difference in whether or not he can do that today. Obviously, things have taken place that, that may or may not have affected his ability to proceed. But we see, as a defense team, an evolution of decompensation. He is clearly getting closer and closer to an inability to come out of the court. It was very difficult yesterday. It's almost impossible today. And even if we were to get him out here today, we don't know whether or not he would be able to proceed tomorrow. There is, a, a, obviously, an impact of stress on his ability to physically carry himself to where he needs to be. So one of the considerations that the court can make is a defect that impairs a defendant's comprehension or hampers his ability to consult with his counsel effectively, whether rising from physical or mental impairment, may lead to a finding of incompetence. So unless we have that head injury properly examined, we don't know whether or not that's the reason why Mr. Whitehead is consistently saying he wants to lay down. It's possible he has a concussion. It's possible he's entirely fatigued. Fatigue is a symptom of concussion. We don't know what happened between him and the deputies. We can fully appreciate that a deputy is not going to respond kindly to being spit upon. So whatever happened, happened, but we don't know the full extent of the medical implications. Judge, I, I apologize. I don't normally like to cut off the opposing counsel, but I'm not sure what we're doing at this exact moment because it seems like Mr. Kane is just admitting a bunch of facts or evidence he then wants to rely on for your honor to make a conclusion. We have an actual doctor here. All right. Whatever objection that is, it's overruled. Go ahead. So before we get to Dr. Benzania's testimony, we're just asking the court to keep in mind that the trial court employee must, I guess in the Holmes case, which is interesting, is that in the Holmes case, an issue of competency came up in trial during Mr. Holmes' testimony. He was a deaf mute. And in that circumstance, the third DCA found that the trial court employed every possible precaution to assure that Mr. Holmes' due process rights were protected prior to the commencement of trial. 
Now, what we expect Mr. Or Dr. Mozenian's testimony to be is that he's going to say that he can't make a determination. Mr. Whitehead only responded to Mr. Or Dr. The doctor in such a way as to say that he wants to lay down. That was his only response. When spoken to and asked a question, Mr. Whitehead said, I want to lay down. That's it. So we don't have an ability right now to determine whether or not Mr. Whitehead is confident. And I'm asking the court out of an abundance of caution to find that he is incompetent and subject him to some level of examination that is going to be observational. Because I suspect that's the only way it's going to happen. Mr. Whitehead needs to be observed in some clinical setting that allows us to determine whether or not he is he is suffering from some sort of mental illness, even though there's not that much of a history of any, or if there is some other obstruction that is preventing him from proceeding. And we believe that is a, an alternative to finding him confident as a result of these proceedings and allowing him, thereby forcing him in some way to proceed in absentia, because we don't see Mr. Whitehead at any point willing to come down to the court. All right. Um, Dr. Frisanigan, do you want to come up, please? Sorry, come around this way. Raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. If you would, please state uh, your name and spell it for the record. Fred Farzanigan. That's in Frank A-R-Z-A-N-E-G-A-N. All right. Would you like to inquire, Mr. Kane? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. Farzanigan. Good morning. Uh, what is your occupation? I'm a clinical psychologist. How long have you been doing that? Uh, about 40 years. What is your education? I have a PhD in uh, psychology. Have you been admitted as an expert in courts of law here in the state of Florida? Yes. How many times? Um, how many times have I actually testified? Yes, sir. I've, I've been doing this for a little over 30 years. And you were contacted by the court this morning? Yes. For what purpose? Uh, to um, conduct a competency evaluation on the uh, defendant, Mr. Whitehead. And just for clarification of the record, he is on the court's list, um, of the court administration's list of appointed experts to accept competency appointments by the courts and not uh, his work comments. Thank you, Your Honor. What time did you meet with, Dr. with Mr. Whitehead? Uh, let's see. An hour and 15 minutes to about 1040. How long was your meeting with Mr. Whitehead? I guess it made about 10 minutes at best. Who was present during that examination? Yourself and um, the gentleman. Mr. McNamara? Yes, Mr. McNamara. And there were two or three jail deputies back there as well? Yes. How was Mr. Whitehead dressed? Dress? Yes. Uh, it looked like a suicide gown uh, that he was wearing. Was he shackled? Yes. Was he in a wheelchair? Yes. And how did, what was his physical appearance, please, as much as you could know? Uh, obviously, he was very disheveled, and uh, I didn't notice the injuries that he uh, sustained. Uh, did you say did not notice? I did not notice. Uh, it was, perhaps he had his head down, and I. And from the picture that I saw, it was behind his ear, so I was not able to, uh, to see them. May I approach the witness, please? Sir. Approaching the witnesses would work as defense one for identification purposes, for purposes of the motion. Do you recognize this? Yes. Yes, I saw it. Yeah. Is that an accurate? Uh, that's a pretty good. Uh, picture of how I saw it here this morning. Yes. All right. In this picture, the second picture. Exhibits 1A and 1B, you want to mark them as such? Yes, ma'am. 
mark this one as 1B. Right. And see, for the purposes of the competency hearing. Thank you. Can you see injuries to Mr. Whitehead's head? Well, I, I see some uh, remnants of, it looks like dried blood. Thank you. What question did you ask Mr. Whitehead when you were introduced to Well, I, I, I introduced myself as a court appointed doctor who has been asked by the judge to conduct a competency uh, evaluation uh, on him and then what he said to me could be used in a report that will go to the judge, prosecutor, and his public defender. And um, uh, as I think his name or age of he, he was totally non-responsive, other than to say, I want a heart attack. That's the only remark that came out of, uh, he said, I could not engage him in, in, in any way. Did you make any determinations of competency? Uh, it would be very difficult for me to say one way or the other whether he is competent. I don't have enough uh, information. I have read. Uh, as much as I could from uh, the jail medical records. Uh, uh, in your interaction with Mr. Whitehead in the jail cell, in the holding cell, could you make any determinations in the lingering? No. So, after you got done meeting with Mr. Whitehead, did you hear anything else from Mr. Whitehead besides, I want to lay down? <laughs> no. And how many times did he say that? I'd say Two. half a dozen. Over how much time? Less than 10 minutes. So after we got done in the holding cell, we came back out to the courtroom, and what did you have an opportunity to review from the defense in terms of records? Well, I was just going through the um, jail medical records, um, which is substantial. I didn't even finish the whole, uh, the whole thing. And then there were uh, records from uh, prison, uh, which I had not had a chance to uh, Review. So in the short period of time that you've been able to either meet with Mr. Whitehead or review certain historical data, have you reached a, a point where you can make a recommendation to the court about how you believe uh, this question should be answered? Well, uh, in view of the, I don't know how he would respond to other evaluators if you get another evaluator to. to you know, whether he would say anything differently. Um, my recommendation would be at this point would be to uh, send him to a uh, state hospital. And the, 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 the rationale for that is that um, if there is a possibility that he is malingering, he doesn't want to face his charges, um, or to say he's not competent because he doesn't know what his charges are and so on. It will all be uh, reviewed and observed. And the, the, the hospitals have a 24-7 you know, kind of monitoring of, uh, of the, their their clients. So whatever they do is processed in terms of is the person competent, not competent, the labor. And so I think um, within a six month period, um, they would be able to come up with a uh, pretty good recommendation. I apologize. In the course of your reviewing the records, you also review the Hillsborough County Sheriff's jail incident hard copy report? Yes. If there's no objection, what else? That's defense two. Ten to the witness. Questions? Doctor, is it fair to say that your uh, recommendation today is the abundance of precaution recommendation? Yes. Uh, 
you are not making a finding that he is, or a recommendation, or a preaching opinion that he is in fact incompetent. Is that correct? Correct. Do you have any experience or any training in uh, concussions or head injuries? I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a psychologist. Okay. Did you see anything physically in Mr. Whitehead's demeanor or behavior that would have led you to believe that he might have suffered a head injury? No. Uh, the wounds or the, the injuries that you saw to his head, uh, they're certainly not large open gashes to his head or anything of that sort. Right? It didn't appear so on the surface. Um, you did not see him doing anything, for example, such as vomiting? No. Uh, he was not rambling incoherently? No. He was not drooling? No. Um, are you aware of, well, you had a chance actually, you were physically present in the courtroom during the time that Mr. Kane was giving sort of an extended narrative of the history of Mr. Whitehead's behavior just before you testified? Were you paying attention to that? No, yes. Okay. Did you hear the fact that Mr. Whitehead, for example, sat yesterday throughout the entirety of jury selection for several hours? Yes, I did. Did, yes, you, I did. did you hear that, for example, he participated in that to whatever extent Mr. Kane described it as? Yes. Are you aware of the fact that at the end, for example, Judge Ward actually asked Mr. Whitehead if he was pleased with the representation that he was given by his attorneys and if he had any issues with the jury selection? Are you aware of the fact that he said he was okay with that? Yes. Are you hearing from me for the first time? Yeah, I'm hearing him from you for the first time. Okay, fair enough. Those things would all certainly suggest to you that he is competent, would they not? I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. Well, I don't mean, know. I, mean, I don't he understood. You know what was being said to him. That doesn't mean he's competent. But one of the things to evaluate is the ability for a person to conform their behavior to appropriate behavior in court. That is one of the things you would consider in determining competency or incompetency. Would you not? Well, I typically don't. That's not the way I look at it. I mean, I'm, I go through the, uh, the six criteria and see how well it does on those. Okay. Well, are you aware of the fact that Mr. Whitehead has already previously been in this courtroom in front of Judge Ward? and has been uh, non-responsive intentionally. Well, he will not respond to the judge. Are you aware of that? Uh, when you say non-responsive intentionally, how do we? We've had previous incidents where Mr. Whitehead has been here, here in court, and Her Honor has addressed comments to Mr. Whitehead, asked him questions, and Mr. Whitehead has intentionally not responded. I think uh, that happened roughly a week ago uh, at pretrial conference. So we could go from today, I believe. Are you aware of that? You're telling me for the first time I am. Are you aware of the fact that at that time, Mr. Kane, the defense attorney, represented on the record that Mr. Whitehead was lucid, coherent, was responding appropriately, that there was no reason at that point for him to raise competency? Of I believe he said that. Okay, so you heard that part. With the fact that Mr. Whitehead did not cause his attorney any competency issues or concerns last week, even when he was non-responsive, for lack of a better phrase, would that in any way impact your decision? At this point, no. I, I, I have no way to know whether he is competent So to proceed at this point. If I was to find any 100 random people off the street and put them in front of you and say, basically, these people are not going to answer you, they're not going to say a word to you, you would just automatically default to, let's send them to the state hospital then? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I could make a judgment. I that, you know, I, 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 Doctor, I appreciate you know, your opinion. I appreciate your opinion. Not your opinion, your, your decision to not make a final opinion. I understand that. What I'm trying to figure out is, if I'm understanding your logic correctly, the fact that a person refuses to open their mouth and refuses to say anything to you, and the fact that there is no other information on which to base an opinion, Objection, Your Honor. This mischaracterizing the testimony. He's basing his testimony on everything he has observed and heard. Okay. Well, tell me, tell me what it is about Mr. Whitehead that says you should send him to the state hospital when he doesn't answer, as opposed to, for example, any other person who wouldn't answer you. Um. Say it again. Sure. Let's posit two people. Mr. Whitehead. Yeah. And then Joe Blow. Mm -hmm. We know that Mr. Whitehead won't answer you. Mm -hmm. And let's pretend that Joe Blow won't answer you. Mm -hmm. What is different about Xavier Whitehead 
that leads you to say he needs to go to the state hospital than from Joe Blow, for example? Well, Mr. Whitehead has allegedly committed a very serious crime, so I would, you know, there's something to be gained by sending him to the state hospital in the sense of finding out whether he really is competent and malingering or is not competent. And if he's not competent, they'll treat him. But there is, you know, in my opinion, there's no sign of mental illness that I have seen in the paperwork that I have read. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't any, but at this point, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good bet that he doesn't have a mental illness. So, if you're willing to reach the opinion at this point that there's a pretty good bet that there isn't mental illness, you're basing your decision or your recommendation to send him to state hospital basically off the fact of he's charged with a crime and he just won't talk to you? That's all it takes? Well, I don't, I don't know what you would do with a defendant who won't talk to you. I got it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Don. You said you were given um, Department of Corrections records. You didn't look at them? Yeah, Your Honor, uh, there are about 150 pages. All right. Well, I, mean, I just got them here since I've been sitting here. All right, well, I'll give you a break then because he was incarcerated from July of 2007 through May of 2017. Right, 10 years. Right, right, seven years, but um, on what you'd agree is daily observations because he's in the Florida State Prison System, correct? Correct. And can you look at the records to see if there's any indication over that seven-year period of time, if there's any indication that there's ever a concern about mental health issues or competency during that time? My guess would be that there probably is not. Okay, well, you don't have to guess because we have the records, right. so I'm going to ask you to look at them for that. All right. And I'd also just to clarify that when, um, when we spoke in the holding cell, I, I updated uh, the doctor on, on everything that we had observed from Mr. White, including his trial participation during jury selection. Uh, Mr. McNamara and I were present for that, so we, we updated him and gave him our full appraisal of his pre-trial conduct as well as his trial conduct yesterday. So that is something that we discussed prior to his testimony. All right. Well, let's give him a few minutes to look through the Department of Correction records that you have then. I'm sure they're divided into uh, daily status reports versus medical records versus psychiatric records, so we could identify those and pull those out if they exist. So let's let that happen. And um, you transported him today from the van to the holding cell to the courtroom? I did. All right. I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. And your name for the record? What is it? And can you describe your interaction with um, Mr. Whitehead in as much detail as you can remember of the events that happened um, up to and including this morning? We arrived in the transportation van. Me and Deputy Ballesta opened the door. He was laying on the floor in the van, would not respond to getting up. We talked to him a little bit and we finally set up for us enough to get him out the van. We had to lift him and turn him, place him in the wheelchair. We wheeled him up to the holding cell. Uh, Mr. McNamara met us outside the holding cell and attempted to speak to him. He said the same thing. I just want to lay down a couple of times. He attempted to talk to him for a while. Wouldn't get much response. We put him in the holding cell. He's pretty much been there long. And is he in the wheelchair because he can't walk? We didn't. Uh, he wasn't. Bearing weight, put it that way. So it's easier for us to move him and place him in the wheelchair. And he's in restraints that were passed, that were put on him by the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. Yes, but you can walk in restraints. And transported via wheelchair for safety and other reasons, then, yes. as opposed to an injury? Yes, ma'am. 
any questions for Deputy Edwards? Deputy, are you aware of any head injuries or strikes or blows to the head that the defendant would have suffered while in the care and custody of the courthouse staff? Courthouse staff? No. When he arrived, there's a uh, small gash on the top of his head, dry blood on the side of his face near his ear. He had a bandage on for the transportation deputies said he was bandaged when they put him inside the van. But that obviously didn't happen in front of you, so you don't know what actually caused that. Correct. Since he's been here in the courthouse, have you seen him do anything on his own? Like as he banged his head on the wall, started jumping off of things and falling head first to the ground, anything where he'd be striking his head? No, sir. Thank you. step down and take a quick look at those DOC records, please, and see if anything uh, relevant seems to appear to you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you have your copy still, or do you need to Okay. Are we back on it? Yes, Judge. I received the CD from the jail of both incidents, I guess. The incident with the inmate and the incident partially, whatever they could record on the incident of the, um, uh, with the bailiffs or the jail detention deputies out there. So I'm going to ask the parties and Dr. Ardanian um, to step up to, to watch that while I watch that as well. Is um, going to play on the TV? No, no. It's right here. Oh. And, um, so, I want to download his jail visitation. I am going to deny the media access to, to um, portray the images here until such time as I can notify the media and the jail uh, personnel no. with whatever objections they deem necessary. They did not give me a copy of the uh, incident readily, stating there were security issues about releasing the film that occurred inside within the jail. So I'm going to give the media a chance to be heard along with the sheriff's office before that becomes any sort of public record. So, yeah, so one thing we would ask for is since it's in evidence, is a copy of the police report and be able to copy the two that were placed in evidence. Okay. Can, I'm not ordering anything. You can make whatever request through the normal channels. I don't think any extra considerations and the rulings I've already made. So Here's my concern with this camera that this is being live streamed even on breaks. Um, so this is potentially recording right now access. Can we take it off the big screen? Uh, it's not on the big screen. It's not it's on big I'm telling the media to refrain from filming at this point in time. Until this is um, video is concluded and for the reasons that I stated the sheriff's office has cited it's um, an, a security issue to broadcast films that occur within the county jail. I will give the media a chance to be heard along with the sheriff's office upon its release but I'm not going to release it since they said that um, they weren't even going to release it to me until I told them that was uh, necessary for this hearing. So. to review the Department of Correction records and looking specifically for psychiatric entries or incidents right. and what, it, what if anything did you find? Well, it, it repeatedly it was uh, written that there is no history of any type of mental illness. And the 
various uh, mental status exams. That they did. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, uh, closer to the mic, sorry. And the various mental status exams that they had uh, done on, on him indicated that he was alert, oriented, no hallucinations, delusions, uh, memory was intact. Um, they do know the antisocial personality disorder in him as well. So there is no psychotropic medications uh, offered to him. Uh, so it's pretty clear that the, uh, there's no mental illness involved All right. at this point. Thank you. Questions from the regarding that issue? Yes. Uh, doctor, the DOC records cover the period 2007 to about 2017, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. All right. Now, I did show you one page from a mental health screening evaluation from 2015, December 4, 2015, where it indicates that, that Mr. Whitehead had been complaining of fears that he was being poisoned, correct? I didn't see that, but uh, I, I, I take your word for it. If, uh, uh, you and I talked about that. You and I just mentioned well, a couple minutes ago that we, where I drew your attention to a portion of the record where it said that uh, that inmate stated he believed an officer was poisoning him. Inmate stated medical that medical had been treating him for nausea and other symptoms, and it, I, I understand. That Handwriting is difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the you would agree that that is probably an unreasonable fear. Would you Would you agree with that? Uh, I think being in prison, I, I, I wouldn't say it'd be unreasonable. I may have thought he was being poisoned, and, and uh, but it didn't apparently it didn't turn out in believing that he was being poisoned does not make him mentally ill. Well, do you believe that, that the Department of Corrections is a, is a, is relatively responsive to inmate psychiatric needs? Would you, would you, is it your opinion that the Department of Corrections is, is vigilant in assessing and, and diagnosing and being, making itself aware of all the mental health conditions of all the inmates? Uh, I, I, I don't know that. I mean, I, I would... They'd have a lot of problem if they were very sensitive. I mean, I think there's a lot that goes on there that isn't caught. I mean, it's just... The way all right, it so it's not unusual, say, for somebody to, to be in prison for 10 years and to be undiagnosed when it comes to, say, an underlying mental health concern. Right. All right. So it's perfectly reasonable that, that Mr. Whitehead, uh, whatever may have been relatively minor, in a minor circumstance, symptomatic in 2015, could develop into something a little bit more severe by, say, 2019. It's possible, but not probable. So, I, mean, you know, I understand when we're looking at the records for some kind of stretching here. Y'all can't bit. talk at the same time. <laughs> I understand we're looking at the records for some sort of comprehensive view of Mr. Whitehead's psychiatric history, but I agree that there's something absent here over the past 10 years. But does the, do the DOC records tell you whether or not Mr. Whitehead is suffering from a mental illness right now? They don't tell me that. And did you see anything in this video that would suggest to you that Mr. Whitehead is not suffering from some mental illness that may be inhibiting his ability to proceed competently in these proceedings. There's no way to know that from seeing the video. And I understand that you're not a, a, a neurologist, and you're not a practicing physician, but can you exclude the possibility that during that, that, that fight that we just witnessed between Mr. Whitehead and another inmate, that Mr. Whitehead may have suffered a head injury? The one that occurred this morning? Yes. So, no way to know. I, 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 Did you see the inmates picking one another up? Slamming each other? 
And only saw Mr. White. It was a fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have no further questions. Anything? Dr. Yu was a passing reference to antisocial personality disorder. You're familiar with that? Yes. And the DSM-5, there's a, a series of criteria that are outlined for antisocial personality disorder. One of those is criteria B, deceitfulness and conning others for personal profit or pleasure. That is one of the accepted criteria of antisocial personality mm -hmm. disorder, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So you would, ex you would expect that a person with antisocial personality disorder might be or would be deceitful and would intentionally con others for some sort of personal gain? Yes. Thank you. Anything else for him, or can I release him? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And again, thank you very much for responding so quickly today. Thank you. on any of the other individuals that I've asked about from the jail. Sorry, Doctor. Here's Lieutenant with an update for you. What about ma'am? Good afternoon. How are you? How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Are you, right. are you here to report to me? I am. All so right. I want to know, okay, so we're trying to figure out who we make that um, One reference in here is reference in the report. I'm going to. Alston, uh, it looks like, I guess this is your ID, your badge number, 257714, it's probably an ID number. And, um, and if possible, nurse practitioner McGlone, and that's ID number 259596. M C G L O N D. Yeah. Who do you want from your transportation? No one know.
things that if you can't for some reason and you're willing to talk to the mental health director, they're there now. But they weren't there at that time. They weren't there. Okay. That's another one you're done. 